Hey, what's up fellas? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host Paul and earlier you saw Max on the gun. Happy New Year! And you know, and speaking of new, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys are new to LPVOs or maybe just new to ARs in general? So if the answer is yes, then maybe this video is for you. So this is something you're interested in, stick around, pop open some rain, and let's go. Magnification. Alright fellas, I think the very first step in selecting an LPVO is identifying your top end magnification. So I think the choice becomes very obvious once you define your intended engagement range from 0 to 200 yards. That's where the irons and red dot territory is because that's the furthest you can see without magnification and identify your target. Out to 300 yards, that's really where 1 to 4s and red dots with magnifiers come into play. Out to 400 yards, that's really where your one to sixes come into play. You can definitely still use one to fours and red dots and magnifiers with BDCs, but your first hit percentage goes up a lot once you move up to one to six. And lastly, if you're shooting out to 500 yards and regularly, definitely go one to eight, one to tens. So I added a little caveat there for the one to eight, one to tens. And the reason I did that is because it has to do with exit pupil. The objective end for most LPVOs has kind of stayed around 24 millimeters for a while because that's really what you need for a, a 1x scope. The exit pupil starts to be affected once you get past 6x magnification. So what you'll see is once you get to 1 8, 1 8, 1 to 10 in low light or dust conditions, once you start to dial past those magnifications, it's going to start to getting dark and a little bit hard to see. So at least for me, I think the best choice for magnification is really the one to six scope as I think it is the best combination of speed, weight, brightness of the reticle without running to the extra pupil problem for a 5.56 based weapon. Illumination and field of view. So daylight bright, what does that actually mean? Well, to me, it means aim point bright like a red dot so it provides enough contrast so you can see the illuminated center when you put it on a target in high noon conditions like this so why is that important well the reason why that's important is because lpvos are meant to be shot like red dots so you need to have that type of contrast additionally in order to do that you need to have a wide field of view and a wide field of view means that when you mount the scope of 1x you will see less of the scope body so you can see around it to your target and maintain target focus. So right now the least you need to spend is around $600 or so for something like the Vortex PST Gen 2. Um, it used to be the Steiner P4XI 1 to 4 but uh, it's gone up in price since then and when I say then that was a long time ago like 2019. You can definitely spend less for a non-daylight bright reticle like the Swamp Fox or Primary Arms, which we've also had on this channel. But just from time test, if time is important to you, they're a little bit slower, especially as you moved into like mixed lighting backgrounds. So when it comes to daylight brightness, uh, check out the rest of our videos, especially on our equipment, and we'll show you the POV footage and let you decide for yourself whether or not those reticles are, are daylight bright. And for FOV specs, definitely check the manufacturer's website. Um, you'll want to look at the FOV at 1x, and you want to look for something greater than 105 feet. The higher the number, the better. Focal planes. So when you're looking at reticles and scopes, you'll see two terms, second focal plane and first focal plane. And from a user standpoint, this is what it means. On second focal plane scopes, the reticle stays the same size despite the magnification. So what that means is that the drops underneath your center dot are only accurate at the magnification from which you zero, and that's typically max magnification. So if you got a one to six scope, you zero at six X, and if it's a second focal plane, the drops are only accurate at six. For a first focal plane scope, the, the reticle changes size proportionally to the magnification. So what that means is the drops are accurate at any magnification. So if you've got a 1 to 8 first focal plane scope and you zero at 8, if you're only at 4x, those drops will be accurate. 
From my experience, first focal plane scopes are really only useful once you get past 8x or so because there is a use case where you're shooting a long range target and you may not want to be at 8 or 10x because you lose a lot of field of view. You may only want to be a 6x so you can see the targets around it. So underneath that, if you got a 1 to 6 scope or something like that, I think that second focal plane scopes are the better choice. One other thing to keep in mind is a lot of scopes that are first focal plane, depending on your cost, are actually really hard to see at 1x unless you have a very daylight bright reticle. So I already mentioned earlier that I like 1 to 6 scopes and generally I prefer second focal plane because when I have a 1 to 6 I'm almost always at 6x when I'm gauging a long range target. It's really rare I go down to 4. but as I mentioned earlier, if you have an 8 or 10x scope, then I can definitely see first focal plane being very handy. Reticle choice. So there's a lot of different reticle types out there, and I generally break them up into these two types. Uh, the first type is the crosshair reticle, and it's the simplest. All it is is some horizontal and vertical lines that draw your eye to the center, and in the center is usually a bright red dot for your CQB type shooting. Now this is a very simple type reticle, so it has some rudimentary wind holds and it has a few stadia for your drops. Okay, the second type of reticle, I usually call it the complex reticle because it has a lot of different moving parts, but it has some commonalities. The first one is, generally you have a circle dot in the center, circle dot like an EOTech. So you can use the outer ring for fast shooting and the center point for some precision. And then around the sides, sometimes you have a ranging reticle for approximate ranging on ipsic size silhouettes. So in case you don't have a laser rangefinder with you. And then below that, you'll have a ladder with some holds, whether in BDC, MIL, or MOA. Now the ladder generally expands out further into the Christmas tree type reticle, because obviously it looks like a Christmas tree, and that thing has a ton of holds. So anytime I see that type of reticle, I think, Okay, you can use this for short distance, especially with a circle dot, but if you see that Christmas tree, generally that type of reticle is really good for long distance shooting. So if that's your priority, then this is a good choice. When you look at the stadia or the lines in the reticle, you have to decide whether or not you want a mills based reticle, milliradians based reticle, or an MOA or a minute of angle based reticle. There's also another option, which is the BDC for the bullet drop compensator type reticle, which is usually measured in MOA. The difference, I think, is that in a mill or MOA based reticle, the spacing between the hash marks are more uniform. So generally you'll have like half mills in between lines or two MOA in between lines. But in a BDC reticle, you'll have 2.2 or 5.6 MOA between lines. It's generally more matched to specific type of ammo and specific type of weapon. If you're comfortable using BDC, I am. I have several reticles that are BDC, use that. Otherwise, mill or MOA based reticles generally are the better choice. So no matter whether you pick an MOA or mill based reticle or BDC, you still have to know your drops. And we'll talk about that later when we talk zeroing. But next, now that we've selected our scope, we need to talk about mounting. Mounting. So when it comes to scope mounts, you got a few decisions to make. The first is whether you want a fixed or QD type mount or quick detach. For a fixed mount, we're talking once you zero the optic on the gun, the optic does not come off. So really it's one optic, one gun type of solution. Uh, I think the best fixed mount we found out there is probably the Aero Precision Ultralights. You've seen them here on this channel. And the reason is because of its name, ultralight. It only weighs three ounces and that's crazy light. And that makes a big difference when we were talking heavy optics like the Vortex Razor. However, that weight does come with a cost in that they're not as sturdy or beefy as some of the bigger mounts. Now, if you want to go QD, what we really love using are here on the channel are the worn mounts. We were starting to use a lot more optics per gun on the channel and their QD levers are really easy to use and the top end rings are very sturdy. You can actually feel them when you're screwing down the top of the mount. So they're excellent options. All these scope mounts are listed in the description below. Now the second decision you need to make when it comes to scope mounts is whether you want a standard or a cantilever type mount. And all this defines is where you want the optic to sit 
on the upper receiver. Standards type mount, they sit closer to your face on the upper receiver, so it's closer to your firing hand. It's gonna feel a little bit lighter because of that. Cantilever mounts push the scope forward towards the hand guard. They give you more space be behind the rail to mount other things on the uh, upper receiver, and it's gonna give you a little bit more field of view because the scope is pushed forward a little bit more. So in general, you can run either type of mount depending upon your collapsible stock position. If you run a stock all the way out or extended, you really can run a standard or cantilever depending upon your neck position. If you run the stock all the way in, you really should run at a minimum a cantilever mount so you can get the scope pushed forward enough to handle that eye relief. So whether you end up with a standard or a cantilever mount, in general what I found that works best is if you align the rear bell of the scope with the charging handle, I found that at maximum magnification and as far as optimal eye relief and my neck position, I run the stock all the way out. That's usually the best position for me, so give it a try and maybe it works well for you as well. One other decision you need to make is how high you want the mount. So when it comes to scope mount height, it's measured from the top of the mount to the center line of the scope. And you'll see two out there. The standard mount comes in 1.5 inches, so that's about 2.7 height over bore. And most mounts you see out there, including on this channel, were the standard height mounts, and they work well for just about everybody. Now the second type of mount is the high mount, and that measures 1.9 or 3 point something for height over bore. And the high mounts, what that allows you to do is, if you're running a laser or a light out front, or maybe you have a fixed front sight still, it raises the optic a little bit. And also, if you want a view that's closer to running a red dot and one-third co-witness or a more heads-up shooting position, a high mount is a really good choice for that type of sh shooting position. The only con is they're a little bit heavier than the standard mounts, so take that into mind. But I have run high mounts before on this channel. I have really big cheekbones, they work well for me. So I'll leave some links below if you want to check them out for yourself. So give them a go. Leveling. If you're doing any long range shooting with your scope, it's really important that when you're mounting it to level the horizontal crosshair with the horizon. There's a few ways to do this. Obviously the cheapest way is just to eyeball it, although it's not the most precise, but it will work in a jam. You can also hang a plumb bob from the ceiling, so you'll align your vertical crosshair with it. But after dealing with multiple scopes, I think the cheapest and easiest way to do it is just to get a scope leveling tool. They're cheap. They're easy to use, and I can link it below if you don't already have one, but the concept is very simple. So as you're putting the scope into the mount and turning it, you'll notice the flat bottom of the vertical turret needs to be aligned with the top of the scope mount. And to do that, you take the tool and you push it in between them, and you just wiggle it in there as you're turning the scope in the mount. That will keep the turret and the scope mount level. So as you level the scope, you start turning the rings to secure the mount, make sure you do not over torque the screws. That's very important. The, I believe the aero precisions are 15 pounds per square inch and the warrants are 20 or 25. Please check me on that. So if you don't have a torque wrench, I highly recommend it. But again, don't over torque the screws. Diopter. Setting the diopter is really important, especially on the LPVO, because it accomplishes two goals. The first is to sharpen the reticle for long distance shooting, and the second is to take out any distortion on the edges and get it as close to 1x as possible. And to do this, I usually do it through three steps. The first thing I do is I aim at a long range target or the sky at max magnification, and I turn the diopter until it is super sharp. And the second step is to dial it back down to 1 look at a target about seven yards or so away so we can do a close range test and then turn the diopter again until all the distortion is removed on the edges and the inside of the scope looks like the outside so you want it as close to 1x as possible. And then the last step is I'll dial it back up to max magnification, look, at, look again at a long range target. So if it's still not sharp, then you just fine tune it from there between those two settings. So you're all set up for shooting. So before you do that, I think it's really important to have some really good targets to confirm and practice your holds. Here at the channel, we really love using Targets USA Steel because it's some of the best out there and it's really easy to set up. So here we have Max to tell you all about it. Take it away, Max. 
Before we zero, we're going to set up our long range targets. We sunk T posts into the ground to hold these Targets USA hangers and C zone steel plates, making our daily setup extremely fast. Also available are these Rhino hangers for a T post or 2x4 base. They hold a knockdown steel target that's quick to reset or can be flipped around to create a static hanging plate. To zero, we're using an adjustable side-by-side -side stand, which allows us to use two paper targets without sacrificing any space in the truck bed. Find Targets USA product links and a coupon code in the description. Now let's get these optics zero. Zeroing. So before we zero, we need to gather some basic ballistic data. The first data point that you're going to need is the ballistic coefficient. So go to your manufacturer's website of your specific ammo and look for the BC ballistic coefficient. Now the second data point you're going to need is the ammo velocity. And we find that out by using a chronograph like this Competition Electronics Pro Chrono. Now my procedure for getting a good velocity reading. You usually put the chrono about 10 feet in front of me, and I fire three to five rounds and get the average velocity, and I write that down. Then you can actually plug that into a ballistics calculator. There's a lot of them out there. Personally, I really like using Strelic just because, number one, it's on my phone, I always have that with me. And the biggest reason is Strelic actually has all the reticles for most of the LPVOs out there. So download that and check it out. If you've never used Strelic before, uh, here's a little quick tutorial walkthrough about the most important parts. Okay guys, this is uh, Strelic, the basic slash free version. So the very first thing I usually do in here is I go into the rifle, set the actual uh, rifle name. So the next thing I do is I usually enable the zeroing weather because uh, it can be affected by a little bit. So I'll go ahead and just turn that on. And then the next thing I do is actually put in the ammo. And let's just say, continuing from my example earlier, we did PMC 55s. And then we'll put in the grains. I think this is just for text purposes. But for the BC, we mentioned this earlier, it's pulling off the website is 0.243. And then for the bullet speed, as uh, we mentioned earlier, you you got that from the chrono reading. If you go to the PMC's website, they actually have the uh, bullet speed for, I think a 24 inch AR. So if you're under that, chances are you are, you generally want to chrono your rounds, although, the general rule is I think 50 feet per second per inch you lose. So you can estimate as well. So we'll go ahead and put 3000 on here because that's usually what I get for a 60 inch barrel. And I hit save and then I go into the scope and first I choose my reticle and I usually choose the reticle by the name because if you search it by any other text for some reason the text doesn't find it so in our example video we're using the uh, Vortex PST so that is the MOA or the MRAD and we're using the MOA scope and you notice the reticle in first plane got unchecked because it knows that the second focal plane scope and it knows its minimum and maximum magnification is one and six. So leave those alone. The ones at the top need to change. So your zeroing distance, usually what I do here is I play with 50, 100, and 200 yard zeros depending upon what access you have to your range and decide based upon what I see in the reticle drop would be easier to memorize and which fit in my engagement range. So I'll put in 100 because generally 100 is a good idea. Your scope height is 2.7. If you use a standard scope mount, if you use a high mount, which is a 193 high mount, the height overboard is 3.1. So put that in there if you use that. So we're zero for 100 yards using that vortex reticle with PMC 55. Hit done. And then let's just see what drops I get. So these are my drops. So 100 yards zero. The first one's 306. The second one's 416. And the last one's 500. So that's pretty good. I would go ahead and just stick with this. Anytime I'm shooting long distance, the only thing I'm thinking about is whether I'm holding dead on, I'm holding high on the top of the target, or I'm holding low. So we'll go ahead and hit save to print out the target. Just to click the bottom left hand corner and hit save the image. And then you'll have what you need out of Strelic. As to the zeroing procedure itself, just take your time with it. Your zero was everything. If you start missing long range targets, you're always gonna come back and check your zero. So just take your time with it. Having said that, I think you should have realistic expectations as far as your grouping size for whatever twist rate and ammo combination you're using. So if you got 55 grains and you're shooting out a one to eight to one to nine barrel, that should group pretty well, but just know that XM193 is spec'd out to be about three MOA. So three inches, hundred yards is a good group. But if you're shooting something like 69 or 77 grain ammo, then I would expect a sub MOA group at 100 yards 
to know that you're really dead on with your zero. Well, once you actually have your zero, one thing to remember is you should always reset your zero index mark. A lot of these scopes, they actually have it to where you need to remove the vertical adjustment turret, spin the numbers until they're aligned back to zero, and turn the screw to secure back down. So that way, if you ever need to dial up your elevation, you can always dial back down to where your zero is. Occluded shooting. So here's a scenario for you. Let's say you're shooting a mid-range target or so, you're in 3X magnification, and in your periphery, you see a close range target that you need to engage. How do you do it? Well, one option is you spin it down to 1X and you engage the target. That'll take a little bit more time, but it will work. But if you're in a hurry, there is another option, and that's using the peripheral vision of your sight to see the illuminated reticle superimposed on the close range target. That's really what occluded shooting is. It's a little trick your brain plays on you when you're looking at a target through your non-dominant eye and their dominant eye is blocked, or in this case, it's through the magnified view. So this method is very effective, but it does take a lot of practice and it does have one other limitation. Because your non-dominant eye is not looking through the tube at one X through the target and the spacing between your eyes is different, you're gonna see some POI point of impact shifts once you get past out 15 yards or so. Because if you shoot any further than 15 yards or so, don't be surprised if you start throwing shots into the neck when you're really aiming for its head. So to negate some of that POI shift, obviously you need to do it closer rather than farther, but another thing is you need to take the shot as soon as possible because the longer you look at it, the more it's gonna start drifting in your sight. Offset sights. So same scenario as before, if you're talking about engaging mid-range target and you see a short-range target in periphery and you have the hardware, use your offset sights. And what exactly is that? All it is is mounting a red dot at the 45 degree angle from your scope. So when you're shooting a long-range target and you wanna shoot a short-range target, just roll the gun 45 degrees and look through the red dot so you're shooting something at one X instead of through the magnified view like you did with occluded. There's a lot of solutions out there, um, personally, I like the JP mount for mounting my red dot at 45 degrees since it's relatively low cost. It's been in use a long time in the competition circuit. For a red dot, it, typically you're going to use a pistol sized red dot. So I like the Trigicon SRO just because the, the window is bigger than most pistol sized dots and it's close to your face. So it's just like shooting a regular rifle sized dot. Just know there are some limitations of the offset sights. Number one is it's more complex and more costly setup. So you have two optics on the gun you have to manage and you actually have something hanging off the side of the gun that can get snagged on something. And number two, when you're actually shooting the gun, it feels different because the gun is canted and it's not recoiling straight up and down, it's kind of recoiling this way. So especially you're gonna notice that when you have a, a muzzle brake that's timed. And because the gun is canted, it's really easy to introduce some POI shifts. So just be aware of that and only use it for short range when you absolutely need it. One final thought about using offsets, there is a setup out there where you can put a higher power primary optic like a three to nine on your upper receiver and use your offsets for your short range only. That's a great setup. I've run that setup myself. However, just know that you are sacrificing the ability to use one X on an LPVO and that shooting an LPVO at one X is always still going to be faster than even shooting a one X on your offset site. So give that a thought. All right, fellas, it's the end of our journey, at least for today. Hopefully we've answered some of your questions. If you have more, please just leave them in the comments. We always look at them. And if you're interested in any of the gear that you see in this video, I'll leave them in the description as well. So please do me a favor. If you found this video useful, please like, comment, and subscribe, and share with your friends so this small channel can keep growing. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next time.